liberty and that love of American values is, uh, is infused in the, the hearts of the American people. I know some people are concerned about the Tea Party movement and so forth. Don't be. Tea Partiers are people who just want to keep America, America. Welcoming people here that bring innovation and creativity and skill, keeping government small and taxes low. Most people in this room will agree with those, with those features. There's a lot of energy and passion there. But something that really gives me uh, encouragement is I think back my, over my experiences in dealing with, uh, with everyday Americans. I, I, when I, I'll tell one story. And then do I get a chance to take questions? Yes, good. Um, uh, when I was serving as, as governor, what a, what a thrill that is, by the way, to, to serve in, in that kind of capacity. Uh, one gets to be the commander-in-chief of the National Guard in your state. Now, that's not the same thing as <laughs> the real commander-in-chief, but it's still quite an experience. And, and in that capacity, the Department of Defense invites governors, sort of two by two or three or four, to go to uh, places of conflict and to meet with the National Guard of your state. Because our National Guard... Those guys are out there on the front lines these days. They are, they are taking uh, bullets in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, even today. And so I got the chance to go to Iraq and Afghanistan, flew there. Um, they would helicopter us from base to base. And Massachusetts, not being a big state, we didn't generally have more than 10 or 15 uh, men and women at any one base. But I'd, I'd meet with them, have a little lunch with them. And then at the end of my little chat with them, I'd say, by the way, if you want me to call your spouse or mom and dad when, when I get home, uh, give me a slip of paper with your name, their names, and the phone number, and I'll call them when I get home. When I left the theater, I had 63 slips of paper. And I thought, that's going to take a long time to get 63 calls done. Uh, I got home the night before Memorial Day. Uh, the next morning, I thought, you know, before the kids wake up and we go water skiing and so forth on Memorial Day, I'm going to bang out three or four of these calls and, and get started. And so on the third call, the woman who answered the phone said, Oh, Governor Romney, I thought that might be you calling. And I, I said, I said what, what do you mean you thought that might be me calling? She said, Well, you called a couple of guys this morning, a couple of uh, spouses this morning. And after you called them, they emailed their spouses in the theater and they'd said that you'd called. And then they emailed all their buddies throughout the theater saying you were calling today. And then they emailed us saying to expect your call. <laughs> So I made 63 calls on Memorial Day. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I have to tell you, I was, um, uh, I was a little hesitant uh, about making the calls because this was before the surge was successful. This was when um, uh, uh, Senator Reid had said we had lost in Iraq. And a lot of people were asking one another, what are we doing there? How can we ever get out? And so forth. And I expected a number of these spouses to say, why is my loved one still there? Why can't you bring them home, Governor? What are you doing to bring them home? And I thought this was going to be a pretty tough series of calls, at least in some cases. In 63 calls, not one complaint, not one complaint of that nature. And, and I, would, I would end the call by saying, on behalf of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and the nation, I want to express my appreciation to you and to your loved one for the sacrifice that your family is making and that your loved one is making in the theater of conflict. And they would either interrupt me through that line or wait until I was finished and say, Governor, you don't understand. It is an honor to be able to serve this country that's the hope of the earth. And I heard that or words to that effect every single call. It... Um, it brought home in my heart again how much people in this country love America. That is a major part of the American culture. It's not just our innovativeness and our love of creativity and pioneering and daring do and our love of liberty. It is also the fact that we recognize that we have something special here. It is in the hearts of the American people. And that's what gives me confidence that even though we make extraordinary mistakes and we have massive challenges, the American people will do as they've always done before which is rise to the occasion and keep America as it has always been the hope of the earth. Thanks so much. Good to be with you today. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> um, you know, it's perhaps uh, best brought home to me, and I'll tell you about my mistakes too, but, but the, the good thing at least about losing in the way I did was that when it was all over, I didn't just go around and kick myself. Oh, if I only would have done this, if I only would have done that, then I could have won this thing. 
And, and I, I didn't end up feeling that way. And the reason was I had a chat with a guy named Mike Levitt, who was Secretary of Health and Human Services, and a good friend, and a brilliant guy. And Mike said to me, he said, you know, he was watching ABC's Wide, Wide World of Sports some years ago. And he said the commentator was, uh, was broadcasting about the National Surfing Championships. And the commentator said that to win a surfing championship requires two things, a good surfer and a good wave. And Mike said, it hit me right then. That's just like politics. Got to be a good surfer, got to catch a good wave. And uh, when I was running in the primary, the wave was all about Iraq. You, you may not recall that, but there was a time when that was all we were talking about. The surge, was it going to work? Madame Bhutto was assassinated in Pakistan. Everything was foreign policy. And a, with a wave like that, John McCain is a pretty compelling figure. That is, uh, that is what he knows best, and we could all talk about it, and we could all have our respective positions. But on that stage talking about Iraq, boy, there's no comparison with John McCain. And John was able to win the, the primaries. Unfortunately, in my opinion for all of us, but unfortunately, shortly thereafter, uh, the wave changed. Iraq disappeared. There were no articles about Iraq anymore. It all became the economy. And that wasn't John's wheel, wheelhouse, of course. And, uh, and, and the surge, uh, if you will, the, the wave surge moved towards Barack Obama. Um, that's part of why I wasn't successful, is that, that uh, Senator McCain ran a good campaign and the wave came his way. The funny thing about politics is it's, it's not terribly predictable. It is, a, 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 in a certain way, like the private sector. I mean, if you've ever been associated with a startup, uh, m most people in this room are probably doing buyouts because there's a higher degree of predictability with a buyout, even with leverage up to your eyeballs, than there is in a startup. And uh, because things happen, you just can't possibly predict. And in, in my race, things happened. I wouldn't have predicted some good, some bad. One of the good ones, George Allen, who would have been a really tough competitor, uh, got out of the race. Boy, that made it easier for me. On the other hand, Rudy Giuliani, who I was hoping would split the vote with John McCain, he ended up faltering. And so John McCain ended up getting a little more boost. And uh, that's just the nature of the process. If, if politics were my career, if I had to define myself as a successful human being by winning or losing elections, boy, that'd be really tough. And I'd be really depressed for having lost. I've lost twice, won once. Uh, but fortunately, politics is something I've done to try and make a difference after I was able to be successful in the business world. My success was defined by what I helped create there and, and my family and faith. And, uh, and so I try and make a contribution. If people are anxious for the skills I've got, great. And if they're not, so be it. Tell them the truth and let, uh, and let uh, the nation uh, do what it feels is right. Thank you. How confident are you of beating Obama in November 2012, Mr. President? <laughs> 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 um, you know, I, I, think, um, I think President Obama will be difficult to beat in 2012 because I think an incumbent has extraordinary advantages. Um, he will pull out all the stops, uh, although he's pulled out so many stops at this point, there may not be a lot more to pull out uh, in terms of Federal Reserve uh, uh, interest rates and, and stimulus and so forth, but he will do everything he can to get the economy going back again. And most likely, at least in my view, the economy will be coming back. He will, you know, you, you can expect Vice President Biden to come out and say that it was the President's great economic accomplishment, that the economy has turned around. Uh, and, and, of course, most of the people in this room will recognize it was in spite of uh, much of what was done in Washington that the economy has turned around. Uh, recessions do end. The economy recovers. It always has. It always will. And uh, that being said, however, they will take credit for the fact that things are getting better. That will help the president's reelection effort. Um, I, think, uh, uh, I think, however, that the American people uh, have established a a perspective on the president which is going to be lasting, that he has not understood uh, uh, the, the nature of, of America in some respects, that the values I've described of, of love of liberty, of freedom, of opportunity, of small government, that those values he doesn't share. And I think it's going to be possible to beat him, but not easy. Uh, I think there will probably be about 10 Republicans on the stage in the first debate. Uh, I can give you some of the names. Uh, I think there will be a lot of folks there. It will be a good group. I don't know who will get the, uh, get the nomination for us. Uh, but I do believe that, that we have a very good shot of uh, replacing uh, President Obama, and I certainly hope so, because uh, four more years of an expansion of government, uh, of the nature of his health care plan, of his regulatory reform plan, 
uh, and, and so forth, I think would be very, very damaging to the economy long term. Okay, one more question. Uh, Governor, I'll let you determine those embarrassing questions. <laughs> Would you mind providing your thoughts and opinions of Sarah Palin? Uh, uh, Sarah Palin is terrific. I have to tell you that, that this, is a, this is a person who brought energy and spunk and passion back into my party. Uh, we, we were getting a little uh, long of tooth in, uh, on our stage, if you will, on the national stage. And, and she re-energized us. I think she also uh, is one of the, if you will, the, the instigators uh, behind the Tea Party movement, which, again, which energy and, and intensity gives us a better shot of picking up seats uh, this fall. Um, so I, you know, I, I can say nothing but positive things about Sarah Palin and, frankly, about others in our race, uh, in our races around the country. We, we have Republicans that are moderates, Republicans that are conservatives, and then Republicans that are mainstream, which I guess is halfway in between. And, and some of the primaries went for one, some went for the other, some went in the middle. Uh, I can't tell you who's going to win and lose, but I can tell you I am delighted to have the array of people we have on the field. We've got a lot of terrific people. We have several, for instance, Marco Rubio in Florida. We've got a Hispanic American. Thank heavens, my party finally has some Hispanic American leaders who are running for statewide office. The governor of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 New Mexico. He's Hispanic American. I believe our candidate in, in uh, uh, Nevada, Hispanic American. This is terrific. We have women candidates, a lot of women candidates running for office. Uh, you know, when, when John McCain sat down and, and I probably put down a list of, of who are some of the leading women in the Republican Party he could select as the VP, it was probably not a real long list. And, uh, and that'll be different uh, two years from now, six years from now, and so forth. So I, I am, uh, I'm excited about the prospects for our party. Um, I, I think, you know, I have to be honest with you, I think our party has it right. Um, I, you know, I respect both parties. I respect people who have uh, very different uh, philosophies about the, the right course for America. Um, but I, I think that my friends in the Democratic Party have a real heavy burden, and, and, uh, and, and true liberals have a heavy burden, and that is that, that their party has become so attached to certain special interests that are highly damaging to America's economic vitality long term that it's a real burden for them. And I, what I mean by that is that the, that the public sector unions really jeopardize the capacity of our states and our federal government to do the jobs they need to do. Uh, that, that in some cases, their, their, their weddedness to the AFL-CIO and their, in, their efforts to try and put in place card check to take away from the American worker the right to a secret ballot in deciding whether they want a union or not, how can that possibly be consistent with true liberal principles? Um, that's a burden. Their association with the trial lawyers that certainly does not help the vitality and growth of the American economy. And, of course, perhaps the, the greatest, uh, I think, distressful part of, of the special interest in, in the opposition party is the strength of the teachers' union. There's a movie about to come out called Waiting for Superman. You may not have heard of it, but it's a, it's a film about, about uh, well, it's the, it's the director of An Inconvenient Truth. It's, it's the same man who put together the, the Bill Clinton uh, uh, video on, on, on his great accomplishments. And, uh, and he's just done a, a film on education. And he went out to understand why our schools and the cities are so terrible. And he concluded that, uh, uh, that it's because of the teachers' unions and the demands of the teachers' unions. And then he went to see, well, how come they have so much power? And concluded in the film, it's because the Democratic Party is so wedded to the teachers' unions that it's pursuing their agenda. These things, I think, are really troublesome for that party. And, uh, and allow my party to stand up and say, we're for the kids. We're for keeping America vibrant, for growing our economy. We're for pr protecting the values of innovativeness and creativity and freedom and opportunity that have made America, America. And as long as we get that message across, particularly to women and to Hispanic Americans and African Americans, then I think we have a shot of being a, uh, a leading party in this country for years to come. I certainly hope so, but whoever wins, I hope that we keep the values that have made us such a great land. And I want to express my appreciation to you. I am one of those who firmly believes that what you're doing is good for America. What you guys do, working hard and making enterprises more productive and building profitability, is a good thing. It's the nature of the free enterprise system. It is being copied by nations all over the world, even as some politicians are running from it. You're doing good stuff, for which I appreciate all that you do. Thanks so much. Good to be with you.